Chapter One of Alexander Hamilton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant. Chapter One Youth and Early Services. Part One. The life of Alexander Hamilton is an essential chapter in the story of the formation of the American Union. Hamilton's work was of that constructive sort which is vital for laying the foundations of new states. Whether the Union would have been formed under the Constitution and would have been consolidated into a powerful nation instead of a loose confederation of sovereign states without the great services of Hamilton is one of those problems about which speculation is futile. It is certain that the conditions of the time presented a rare opportunity for such a man as Hamilton, and that without some directing and organizing genius like his, the consolidation of the Union must have been delayed and have been accomplished with much travail. The difference between the career of Hamilton in America and that of the two greatest organizing minds of other countries caesar and napoleon marks the difference between anglo-saxon political ideals and capacity for self-government and those of other races where the organization of a strong government degenerated in rome and france into absolutism it tended in america under the directing genius of hamilton to place in the hands of the people a more powerful instrument for executing their own will so powerful a weapon was thus created that hamilton himself became alarmed when it was seized by the hands of jefferson madison and other democratic leaders as the instrument of democratic ideas and those long strides were taken in the states and under the federal government which wiped out the distinctions between classes abolished the relations of church and state extended the suffrage and made the government only the servant of the popular will the development of two principles mark the early history of the republic one the growth of sentiment for the union under the inspiration of hamilton and the federalist party the other the growth of the power of the masses typified by the leadership of jefferson and the democratic party these two tendencies seemingly hostile in many of their aspects waxed in strength together until they became the united and guiding principles of a new political order a nation of giant strength whose power rests upon the will of all the people it was the steady progress of these two principles in the heart of the american people which in the fullness of time made it possible for the union to be preserved as a union of free men under a free constitution to hamilton the creator of the machinery of the Union, and to John Marshall, the great Chief Justice, who interpreted the Constitution as Hamilton would have had him do, in favor of the powers of the Union, this result was largely due. If Caesar, fighting the battles of Rome on the frontier of Germany, and kept from party quarrels at home, and Napoleon, born outside of France, and free by his campaign in Egypt from the compromising intrigues of Parisian politics, were preeminently fitted by these accidents to transmute the spirit of revolution from chaos into order. Hamilton stood in somewhat the same position in America. Born in the little island of Nevis, in the West Indies, January 11, 1757, he came to the United States when his mind was already mature in spite of his fifteen years he came without the local prejudices or state pride which influenced so many of the revolutionary leaders and was therefore peculiarly qualified to fasten his eyes steadfastly upon the single end of the creation of a nation rather than the ascendancy of any single state he was so free from local attachments that he even hesitated at first on which side he should cast his lot whether with the imperial government of great britain which appealed strongly to his love of system and organized power 
or with the struggling revolutionists with their poor and undisciplined army and uncertain future the possibility of winning distinction in the service of great britain must have attracted him but the justice of the colonial cause spoke more strongly to his sense of right and his well-ordered mind the great services of hamilton were nearly all performed before he was forty years of age his precocity was partly derived from his birth in the tropics and partly perhaps from the unfortunate conditions of his early life a mystery hangs over his birth and parentage which repeated inquiries have failed to clear away he is believed to have been the son of james hamilton a scottish merchant of nevis and a lady of french huguenot descent the divorced wife of a dane named levine but the history of his parents and their marriage is shrouded in much obscurity the father although reduced to poverty lived nearly if not quite as long as his illustrious son but the mother was reported to have died while hamilton was only a child leaving the memory of her beauty and charm in one of the chambers of his infant mind hamilton sought in his later years to establish regular communications with his father and he had a brother in west indies with whom he corresponded but the fact that all these relatives remained so much in the background gave some color to the slanders of his enemies concerning his birth to offset the disadvantages of birth hamilton had neither the fascinating manners which go straight to the hearts of men nor the imposing personal presence which in the orator often invests trifling platitudes with sonorous dignity he was possessed of a light and well-made frame and was erect and dignified in bearing but was much below the average height his friends were wont to call him the little lion because of the vigor and dignity of his speech he had the advantage of a head finely shaped large and symmetrical his complexion was fair his cheeks were rosy and in spite of a rather large nose his face was considered handsome his dark deep-set eyes were lighted in debate with a fire which controlled great audiences and cowed his enemies but it was chiefly the power of pure intellect which gave him control over the minds of other men there was nothing mean or low in his character but he had not a high opinion of the average of humanity and therefore lacked somewhat in that ready sympathy with the minds of others which is so useful to politicians and party leaders hamilton was early thrown upon his own resources his father became a bankrupt and he was cared for by his mother's relatives his education was aided by the reverend hugh knox a presbyterian clergyman with whom hamilton kept up an affectionate correspondence in later years the boy was only thirteen years of age when he was placed in the office of nicholas kruger a west indian merchant here his self-reliance and methodical habits made him master of the business and head of the establishment when his employer had occasion to be away his remarkable capacity and his occasional writings for the daily press led to a determination by his relatives and friends to send him to a wider field here he was accordingly supplied with funds and sent to boston where he arrived in october of seventeen seventy two still less than sixteen years of age he was fortunately provided with some strong letters of recommendation from dr knox and was soon at a grammar school at elizabethtown new jersey where he made rapid progress he desired to enter princeton but his project of going through the courses as rapidly as he could without regard to the regular classes was in conflict with the rules he therefore turned to king's college new york now columbia university where he was able with the aid of a private tutor to pursue his studies in the manner which he wished the decision of hamilton to take the side of the colonies in the conflict with england was made early in seventeen seventy four partly as the result of a visit to boston among the well-to-do classes of new york the dominant feeling was in favor of great britain and the control of the assembly was in the hands of the friends of the crown hamilton found boston the hotbed of resistance to england 
and listened attentively to the reasoning by which the strong prejudices on the ministerial side which he himself declares he had formed gave way to the superior force of the arguments in favor of the colonial claims the opportunity soon came for him to make public proclamation of his position a great meeting was held in the fields july sixth seventeen seventy four to force the hand of the tory assembly in the matter of joining the other colonies in calling a congress hamilton attended and after listening to the speeches was so strongly impressed with what was left unsaid that he worked his way to the platform and began an impassioned argument for the colonial side below the normal stature and of slender form he looked even younger than his seventeen years but was recognized by the crowd as a collegian and received with great enthusiasm the fields of that day occupied what is now city hall park then the upper limit of new york king's college was in the immediate neighborhood the name still lingering in college place hamilton was soon at the forefront of the fight for civil liberty which was carried on by means of pamphlets and newspaper addresses his papers which appeared without signature showed so much ability that they were attributed to the most eminent of the patriot leaders after the die was cast at lexington for armed conflict hamilton early in seventeen seventy six received the command of a company of artillery its thorough discipline attracted the favorable notice of green and other leaders green introduced hamilton to washington who had early occasion in the disastrous battle of long island when hamilton protected the rear with great coolness and courage to measure the mettle of his young artillery officer end of chapter one part one chapter two of alexander hamilton this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant. Chapter 2 The Fight for the Constitution. Part 1 hamilton was not a conspicuous national figure during the four years which elapsed between the termination of his term in congress and his appearance in the federal convention of seventeen eighty seven he was working none the less earnestly and persistently however in favor of a stronger union movements towards this union took form almost simultaneously in different parts of the country under the impulse of a common need the wise and thoughtful words of washington in his circular letter to the governor of each state on surrendering the command of the army june eighth seventeen eighty three sank into many hearts and did much to soften local prejudices against giving more power to the central government the state of virginia in december seventeen eighty three ceded her northwestern territory to congress and granted a general impost significance was given to the act by the policy of the governor in communicating it to the executive authority of the other states with the suggestion that they do likewise jefferson was as cordial a supporter as madison at that time of the project of a federal union as a member of congress he prepared a plan for intercourse with the powers of europe and the barbary states in which he described the united states as one nation upon the principles of the federal constitution only two states rhode island and connecticut voted to substitute weaker words in describing the union it was voted by eight states to two march twenty sixth seventeen eighty four that in treaties and in all cases arising under them the united states formed one nation the need for uniform rules for the regulation of commerce on the potomac and the creation of roads and canals led to a number of conferences during the next two years between virginia and maryland in one of which washington played the part of referee the legislature of maryland finally took a step which shot a bright ray of light through the darkness surrounding the prospects of a permanent union 
in a letter to the legislature of virginia december seventeen eighty five it proposed that commissioners from all the states should be invited to meet and regulate the restrictions on commerce for the whole madison in virginia gave cordial welcome to the invitation he had already gone beyond the sentiment of his state in his zeal for union but at his instigation a meeting of delegates from the states was called by virginia at annapolis maryland for september seventeen eighty six hamilton snatched at the opportunity which this invitation presented several of his friends were elected to the legislature of new york and made the appointment of delegates to annapolis their paramount object in spite of much hostility they succeeded in wresting authority from the legislature for a commission of five. Hamilton and Benson were the only two of these delegates who appeared at Annapolis. They found only four other states represented there. It was determined that the best that could be done by the little gathering was to urge upon the states a general convention to meet at Philadelphia on the second Monday of the next May, to consider the situation of the United States and devise such further provisions as should appear necessary to render the constitution of the federal government adequate to the exigencies of the union hamilton was not a member of the committee appointed to prepare the report but it was his draft which with some modifications to meet the sensibilities of the virginians was accepted and adopted a path was now blazed in which those who favored a stronger union could walk in harmony hamilton returned to new york with the intention of exerting his whole strength in behalf of the convention he secured an election to the legislature and at once took the lead of the members opposed to the separatist policy of governor clinton he assailed the governor on the question of granting an impost to congress in a practicable form but was beaten by the solid vote of the party in power he succeeded better with his resolution for the appointment of five delegates to the convention at philadelphia the senate cut down the number to three and two of them chief justice robert yates and john lansing jr were resolute supporters of the governor but hamilton carried the vital point that new york should be represented in the federal convention and he was himself one of the delegates it was not until late in february seventeen eighty seven that this action was taken little more than three months before the meeting of the convention and it was a few days later when formal approval was given to the project by the federal congress hamilton although one of the three delegates from new york to the convention was embarrassed throughout the proceedings by the open hostility of his associates to any vigorous steps towards a strong union He had definite ideas and strong feelings, however, and could not restrain himself from setting forth his views of what the new government should be. When Dickinson proposed that the convention should seek union through a revision of the old Articles of Confederation, Hamilton took the floor, June 18, 1787, to show how inadequate such a measure would be, and to set forth his own long-matured views. He spoke for six hours reviewing the history of the colonies before the revolution during its progress and afterwards the steps which had been taken towards union and the imperative necessity which had been disclosed for a government possessing complete powers within its fields of action he urged that the convention adopt a solid plan without regard to temporary opinions he laid bare unsparingly the defects of the confederacy and insisted that the articles of confederation could not be amended with benefit except in the most radical manner he opposed strongly the creation of a general government through a single body like congress because it would be without checks he continued the general government must not only have a strong soul but strong organs by which that soul is to operate i despair that a republican form of government can remove the difficulties i would hold it however unwise to change it the best form of government not attainable by us but the model to which we should approach as near as possible is the british constitution praised by necker as the only government which unites public strength with individual security its house of lords is a most noble institution it forms a permanent barrier against every pernicious innovation whether attempted on the part of the crown or of the commons 
Hamilton made little concealment of his belief that the new government should not be exclusively Republican. He said on June 26, 1787, I acknowledge I do not think favorably of Republican government, but I address my remarks to those who do, in order to prevail on them to tone their government as high as possible. I profess myself as zealous an advocate for liberty as any man whatever, and trust I shall be as willing a martyr to it, though I differ as to the form in which it is most eligible. Real liberty is neither found in despotism nor in the extremes of democracy, but in moderate governments. Those who mean to form a solid republic ought to proceed to the confines of another government. If we incline too much to democracy, we shall soon shoot into a monarchy. In pursuance of these views, Hamilton urged that all branches of the new government should originate in the action of the people rather than of the states. In this respect, he came closer to democracy than some of his opponents, but he proposed to give strength and permanence to the government by providing that the senators and the executive should hold office during good behavior. He contended that by making the chief executive subject to impeachment, the term monarchy would not be applicable to his office. Another step, differing radically from the Constitution as adopted, and showing the unswerving purpose of Hamilton to give supremacy to the central government, was the proposal that the executive of each state should be appointed by the general government, and have a negative on all state legislation. Hamilton had no expectation that his plan would be adopted. What he sought was to key the temper of the delegates up to a pitch which would bring them as nearly to his ideal of what the new government should be as was possible under the circumstances of the times. His long speech was attentively listened to, and even Yates reported that it was praised by everybody but supported by none. Notwithstanding these criticisms, the Constitution, as it was finally adopted, embodied many of the features of the project which was outlined by Hamilton. A legislative body of two houses, the choice of the executive by electors, a veto for the executive over legislative acts, the grant of the treaty-making power to the executive and the Senate, the confirmation of appointments by the Senate, the creation of a federal judiciary, and the provision that state laws in conflict with the Constitution should be void. These and many other features of the existing Constitution were parts of the plan of Hamilton. It was not the open preference which Hamilton expressed for the British form of government which caused distrust of his plan. This was neither startling nor offensive to the great majority of those who heard him. Representative government under a Republican head had not then been tried upon a large scale in any part of the world. Such small republics as existed in ancient times and in Italy had been confined within narrow areas, and had in many cases presented examples of factional strife which were far from encouraging to the friends of liberty. The Americans, in revolting against Great Britain, revolted only against what they considered the false interpretation given by King George to the guarantees of the English Constitution, wrested by their ancestors from King John and his successors, and consecrated by the Revolution of 1688. It was far from the thoughts of the most extreme, with perhaps an occasional personal exception, to cut loose from the traditions of English liberty, tear down the ancient structure, and build from the ground up, as was done a few years later in France by the maddened victims of the oppression of the nobles. The sentiment most strongly opposed to the views of Hamilton was not democratic sentiment in the strictest sense of the word, but devotion to local self-government. Hamilton was democratic enough to insist, in the discussion of the manner of choosing members of the House of Representatives, it is essential to the democratic rights of the community that the first branch be directly elected by the people. What he desired was strength at the center of authority, from whatever source that authority was derived. Coming from a little West Indian island, where the traditions of parliamentary government had little footing, he attached no such importance as most of his associates to the reserved rights of the states. He was the man for the hour as the champion of a strong government. But it would not have been fortunate in some respects if his views had been adopted in their extreme form. 
there never was the slightest chance as he doubtless knew that they would be adopted by the descendants of english freemen who had founded self-governing states in accord with their own principles on the western shores of the atlantic having delivered a single strong speech which pointed the way towards a strong union hamilton remained comparatively in the background during the remainder of the convention it was inevitable however that he should make himself heard upon the proposal that the new government should have power to emit bills on the credit of the united states the power to issue unfunded paper had received his censure four years before as one of the defects of the existing articles of confederation he now opposed in the most emphatic manner the grant of authority to the new government to issue paper money in the form of its own notes and to force them into circulation as a substitute for gold and silver coin when governor morris moved to strike out the power to issue bills on the credit of the united states and was supported by madison it was supposed that if the motion prevailed the power to issue government paper money and make it a legal tender for debts was guarded against for all time the power was stricken out of the constitution by a vote of nine states against two madison decided the vote of virginia and declared that the pretext for a paper currency and particularly for making the bills a tender either for public or private debts was cut off it is not surprising that mr bancroft the jealous friend of the constitution in spite of the opening of the door at a later period by the supreme court of the united states declared this is the interpretation of the clause made at the time of its adoption alike by its authors and by its opponents accepted by all the statesmen of that age not open to dispute because too clear for argument and never disputed so long as any one man who took part in framing the constitution remained alive end of chapter two part one recording by daniel vermont osaka japan Chapter Three of Alexander Hamilton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant. Chapter Three Establishing the Public Credit. Part One the great work of hamilton which was to stamp his name forever upon american history and our frame of government was yet before him washington was inaugurated in april seventeen eighty nine but it was not until september the second that an act passed congress establishing the treasury department hamilton was the selection of washington for the new post it was a selection so well approved by all who were familiar with hamilton's great abilities as an organizer and financier that the nomination was confirmed on the day that it reached the senate the studies of many years the program which had been outlined in letters to morris and in the newspapers were now to bear fruit under the directing genius of hamilton only ten days passed after his appointment before congress requested him to prepare a report upon the public credit then came calls for reports on the collection and management of the revenue estimates of receipts and expenditures the regulation of the currency the navigation laws the post office and the public lands money had to be found at once for the pressing needs of the new government before the more elaborate projects of the young minister of finance could be put in operation but hamilton did not delay long even for the more important and permanent work when congress met in january he submitted his celebrated report on public credit which laid the cornerstone of american finance under the constitution this report of hamilton's on the public credit has long stood out as one of the master state papers of american history read to-day in the light of the economic progress of more than a century its conclusions are not entirely novel but are in the main clear and sound to obtain a proper perspective regarding their value the mind should be projected back to the beginning of seventeen ninety when political economy as a science had barely been born and the work of adam smith 
although about fourteen years old, was probably known to but few in America. Many public men of today with the proper preliminary training might evolve as sound a report as that of Hamilton, but no ordinary man could have done it a hundred and ten years ago, and few men could do it today with the force of diction, precision and directness of statement, the grasp of principles and the mastery of detail which marked the work of Hamilton. He seemed to gather in his hands all the tangled threads of the disordered finances of the Continental Congress and of the States, and show how they could be woven into a band of strength and symmetry, holding together by the motive of enlightened self-interest all the parts of the new union. He proposed to plant the public credit upon a firm foundation, satisfy the public creditors, and put the nation on the high road to industrial and financial progress. The difficulties which Hamilton confronted were not merely a bankrupt treasury and a loose system of finance under the federal government, but large expenditures by the states for carrying on the Revolutionary War, for which reimbursement was demanded by the states which had spent the most, and was opposed by those which had spent the least. Hamilton endeavoured to show that all would gain by the assumption of these debts by the federal government. Although a thinker rather than a tactician, he was shrewd enough to make an appeal early in his report to all men engaged in industry by pointing out the importance of public credit upon the volume and profits of private business. He endeavoured first to make clear the benefit to any government of a sound fiscal system. He said upon this point, quote, As on the one hand the necessity for borrowing in particular emergencies cannot be doubted, so on the other it is equally evident that to be able to borrow upon good terms it is essential that the credit of a nation should be well established for when the credit of a country is in any degree questionable it never fails to give an extravagant premium in one shape or another upon all the loans it has occasion to make nor does the evil end here the same disadvantage must be sustained upon whatever is to be bought on terms of future payment from this constant necessity of borrowing and buying dear it is easy to conceive how immensely the expenses of a nation in the course of time will be augmented by an unsound state of the public credit End quote. taking up the demonstration how closely the public credit is linked with the fortune of the individual hamilton points out that public securities are a part of the medium of exchange that sound credit will extend trade by preventing the export of money and that agriculture and manufactures will be promoted because quote, more capital can be commanded to be employed in both end quote, and that the interest of money will be lowered hamilton took up and punctured in his report several fallacies regarding the treatment of the debt which had obtained lodgment in the public mind and threatened to influence the action of congress one of these was that a distinction should be made between those holders of the debt to whom it was originally issued and those who had acquired it by purchase as the latter holders had bought the debt in some cases at a mere fraction of its face value and for speculative purposes the specious argument was made that they were entitled in the settlement with the government only to what they had paid the original holders hamilton set himself to dissipate this prejudice by showing that the man who had been willing to purchase the public debt might be quite as patriotic as the man who had parted with it for a price he suggested that if the debt was thus purchased in the confidence that it would rise to par the act was a proof of the patriotism of the purchaser and it would be a sorry return for this confidence to make it a reason for discrimination against him but much more important from the public point of view he pointed out was the sanctity of contracts guaranteed by the new constitution and absolutely required to give a stable character to the securities of the government 
if the government were to discriminate between the original holders of the debt and other holders he made it clear that a degree of discredit would be cast on all the obligations of the united states no matter in whose hands they were found which would tend to defeat the end and aim of all his measures the restoration of public credit upon this point he said quote, the nature of the contract in its origin is that the public will pay the sum expressed in the security to the first holder or his assignee the intent in making the security assignable is that the proprietor may be able to make use of his property by selling it for as much as it may be worth in the market and that the buyer may be safe in the purchase every buyer therefore stands exactly in the place of the seller has the same right with him to the identical sum expressed in the security and having acquired that right by fair purchase and in conformity to the original agreement and intention of the government his claim cannot be disputed without manifest injustice the impolicy of a discrimination results from two considerations one that it proceeds upon a principle destructive of that quality of the public debt or the stock of the nation which is essential to its capacity for answering the purposes of money that is the security of transfer the other that as well on this account as because it includes a breach of faith it renders property in the funds less valuable consequently induces lenders to demand a higher premium for what they lend and produces every other inconvenience of a bad state of public credit end of chapter three part one Chapter Four of Alexander Hamilton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Vermont. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant. Chapter Four. Congress sustains Hamilton the plans of hamilton having been formulated it remained to be determined whether they should be adopted by the law-making power or should remain a splendid but abortive monument to the constructive skill of their author vigorous opposition was expected by hamilton to the measures which he proposed he had endeavored to meet and disarm such opposition as far as possible in the careful and illuminating language of his report but it soon became evident that against nearly all parts of it a bitter and persistent battle would be waged the owners of capital and the commercial element were represented in the northern and eastern states rather than in the south and the representatives of the former states strongly supported from the first the entire policy of the secretary of the treasury rumors were already abroad that something was to be done to restore the national credit but it was not until the reading of hamilton's report in the house january fourteenth seventeen ninety that the full scope of his plans was made manifest the effect of the report was so favorable upon the public credit as to forge weapons for its enemies this came about through the sudden rise in the public funds and the promptness with which speculators bought them up from holders who were ignorant of their value funds which would have been gladly disposed of at three shillings to the pound or fifteen per cent of their face value at any time within the previous three years rose before noon the next day fifty per cent of their quoted price it was not yet certain that the project would be adopted by congress but shrewd men were willing to discount the future in much the same manner that brokers in wall street do at the present time the absence of a well-organized stock market with the ramifications of telegraphic quotations throughout the union put in the hands of the more daring of these speculators an opportunity to avail themselves of the ignorance of others to an extent which would not be possible to-day agents were soon scouring the country buying up the certificates of the debt in all its varied forms before the news of hamilton's great report had reached the humble holders some of whom were old soldiers or quiet farmers who had been compelled to furnish supplies for the army jefferson says in his annus 
couriers and relay horses by land and swift-sailing pilot boats by sea were flying in all directions active partners and agents were associated and employed in every state town and county and the paper bought up at five shillings and even as low as two shillings in the pound before the holder knew that congress had already provided for its redemption at par this sudden and remarkable effect of hamilton's recommendations put weapons in the hands of the enemies of the project because it seemed to give force to their argument that a distinction should be made between those to whom the debt was originally issued at par and the new holders who had obtained it at a discount long and bitter were the debates in the house over this and other branches of hamilton's project but it was so obvious that a distinction between the holders of the debt would run directly counter to its character as negotiable paper and would be almost impossible of just execution that the friends of the funding project easily had the best of the argument madison although inclined to oppose hamilton was forced to admit that the debt must be funded at par without discrimination he brought forward a project to pay the original holders the difference between par and the price at which they had sold and to pay to the present holders only what they had paid for the securities this was shown to be so impracticable that only thirteen votes were given for it in a house of forty-nine members voting the advocates of the entire funding project carried it in committee of the whole march ninth seventeen ninety by a vote of thirty-one to twenty-six the debates had so strengthened the position of hamilton that the wisdom of funding the debt of the union at par was now generally admitted his opponents and those who feared too great a concentration of power in the capitalist class and the central government made their stand on the proposal to assume the state debts when the resolution reported by the committee of the whole was taken up in the house on march twenty ninth several representatives from north carolina appeared in the house and swelled the ranks of the opposition north carolina had been late in accepting the constitution and her members had not been present on previous votes when therefore a motion to recommit the financial projects was made it was carried by a vote of twenty nine to twenty seven the advocates of assumption were so indignant and so convinced that one part of the project was as vital as the other that they voted to recommit the original funding resolution further debate took place but without shaking the firmness of the opposition to the assumption of the state debts the project was rejected in committee april twelfth by a vote of thirty one to twenty nine the situation was a grave one hamilton felt that the future of the union was at stake if his projects were not adopted substantially as a whole the new government would be without credit and the work of the convention of seventeen eighty nine would be in vain the government at washington would be as helpless as the continental congress and its committees had been this opinion was shared by all those who favored a vigorous central government and practically by all the members of the party in congress which was forming in support of the measures of hamilton and looking to him as their leader while casting about for some means for meeting the emergency hamilton fell upon a plan which represents one of the few cases in which he had recourse to diplomacy in his public career the question of the location of the national capital had been for some time pending in congress it had already become involved with the assumption of the state debts a strong bid had been made by the opponents of assumption for the five votes of pennsylvania by the offer to locate the capital for fifteen years at philadelphia the importance of having congress and its officials in a given city represented more at that time in spite of the small size of the body and the relative insignificance of the interest before it than would be the case to-day with either of the great commercial cities of new york boston or philadelphia local interests played the same part then as now in political maneuvering and possession of the capital looked larger in the eyes of some members than the financial policy of the union in the sarcastic language of professor mcmaster the state debts might remain unpaid the credit of the nation might fall 
but come what might the patronage of congress must be drawn from new york and distributed among the grog shops and taverns of philadelphia hamilton took advantage of this situation to save assumption and to fix the financial policy of the united states the senate had rejected the proposal to establish the capital at philadelphia and when the project came back to the house baltimore was substituted by a majority of two the pennsylvanians and their friends in the senate retaliated by mutilating the funding bill and daring the assumptionists to reject it the latter held to their position and rejected the bill thirty five to twenty three it was while matters were in this acute stage while threats were made on behalf of the north that the union would be broken up if assumption were not carried that hamilton one day in front of the president's house met thomas jefferson jefferson had recently returned from france to assume the position of secretary of state what followed is best told in jefferson's own words because he afterwards claimed that he had been duped by hamilton and acted without knowledge of the effect of what he was doing jefferson's account of the matter is as follows as i was going to the president's one day i met him hamilton in the street he walked me backwards and forwards before the president's door for half an hour he painted pathetically the temper into which the legislature had been wrought the disgust of those who were called the creditor states the danger of the secession of their members and the separation of the states he observed that the members of the administration ought to act in concert that though this question was not of my department yet a common duty should make it a common concern that the president was the center on which all administrative questions ultimately rested and that all of us should rally around him and support with joint efforts measures approved by him and that the question having been lost by a small majority only it was probable that an appeal from me to the judgment and discretion of some of my friends might effect a change in the vote and the machine of government now suspended might be again set into motion i told him that i was really a stranger to the whole subject that not having yet informed myself of the system of finance adopted i knew not how far this was a necessary sequence that undoubtedly if its rejection endangered a dissolution of our union at this incipient stage i should deem that the most unfortunate of all consequences to avert which all partial and temporary evils should be yielded i proposed to him however to dine with me the next day and i would invite another friend or two bring them into conference together and i thought it impossible that reasonable men consulting together coolly could fail by some mutual sacrifices of opinion to form a compromise which was to save the union the discussion took place i could take no part in it but an exhortatory one because i was a stranger to the circumstances which should govern it but it was finally agreed that whatever importance had been attached to the rejection of this proposition the preservation of the union and of concord among the states was more important and that therefore it would be better that the vote of rejection should be rescinded to effect which some members should change their votes but it was observed that this pill would be peculiarly bitter to the southern states and that some concomitant measure should be adopted to sweeten it a little to them there had been projects to fix the seat of government either at philadelphia or at georgetown on the potomac and it was thought that by giving it to philadelphia for ten years and to georgetown permanently afterwards this might as an anodyne calm in some degree the ferment which might be excited by the other measure alone some two of the potomac members white and lee but white with a revulsion of stomach almost convulsive agreed to change their votes and hamilton undertook to carry the other point in doing this the influence he had established over the eastern members with the agency of robert morris with those of the middle states effected his side of the engagement hamilton had little of the state pride which influenced the men of massachusetts new york virginia 
or of any other state who had grown up on the soil won by their english ancestors by their blood or the sweat of their brows to him the question of the location of the capital seemed insignificant in comparison with the foundation of the union upon the rock of a comprehensive financial policy it is significant of the commanding influence which the young secretary had acquired and the well-knit party which was gathering around him that he had no difficulty in carrying his part of the program for seating the capital eventually on the banks of the potomac the bill to remove the capital was passed on july ninth seventeen ninety by a majority of three and the assumption of the state debts was carried soon after the form of the assumption differed somewhat from the proposal of hamilton but it accomplished the result at which he aimed a specific sum twenty one million five hundred thousand dollars was assumed by the government and distributed among the states in set proportions the project passed the senate july twenty second by a vote of fourteen to twelve and the house on july twenty fourth by a vote of thirty four to twenty eight a great step was thus taken in the consolidation of the union and notice was given to the world that the united states proposed to pay their debts and fulfill with scrupulous honor their financial obligations end of chapter four recording by daniel vermont osaka japan chapter five of alexander hamilton this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant Chapter 5. Strengthening the Bonds of Union, Part 1 The funding of the debt was only one of several parts of the policy of Hamilton for putting the new government upon a solvent and firm basis. The session of Congress, which began in December 1790, witnessed the presentation of his report in favor of a national bank. This report, like that on the debt, showed careful study of the subject in its theoretical as well as practical aspects. Hamilton referred in the opening to the successful operation of public banks in Italy, Germany, Holland, England, and France. He then went on to point out some of their specific advantages in concentrating capital and permitting the easy transfer of credit. He declared that such a bank would afford greater facility to the government in obtaining pecuniary aid, especially in sudden emergencies. It would also facilitate the payment of taxes by enabling taxpayers to borrow from the bank and by which the aid which it would give in the transfer of funds. He did not shrink from declaring that the country would benefit if foreigners invested in the bank shares, since this would bring so much additional capital into the United States. Hamilton then pointed out the vital distinction between government paper issues and bank paper. He laid down thus the fundamental principle of a well-regulated banknote currency. Quote, Among other material differences between a paper currency issued by the mere authority of government, and one issued by a bank, payable in coin, is this, that in the first case there is no standard to which an appeal can be made as to the quantity which will only satisfy, or which will surcharge the circulation. In the last, that standard results from the demand. If more should be issued than is necessary, it will return upon the bank. Its emissions, as elsewhere intimated, must always be in a compound ratio to the fund and the demand, whence it is evident that there is a limitation in the nature of the thing, while the discretion of the government is the only measure of the extent of the emissions by its own authority. End quote. The bank which Hamilton proposed was private in its ownership, but the United States were to pledge themselves not to authorize any similar institution during its continuance. The capital of the bank was not to exceed ten million dollars, for which the President of the United States might subscribe two million dollars on behalf of the government. 
it was further provided that three-fourths of the amount of each share might be paid in the public debt instead of gold and silver it was the purpose of hamilton not merely to create a useful financial institution in which the government would be able to keep its deposits but to weld the monetary system of the country into a harmonious whole the result of this which he foresaw and intended was to bind the property-owning classes to the interests of the new government the effect was much the same as the creation of the bank of england by the loan of its capital to the government which bound the moneyed classes firmly to king william through the knowledge that the debt and the solvency of the bank depended on the perpetuation of his government and the exclusion of the stuart pretender the tendency of hamilton's project was clearly seen by jefferson and other democratic leaders and did not fail to arouse their hostility it was not long before they promptly took sides against the national bank jefferson wrote regarding the meetings of the cabinet at this time that hamilton and myself were daily pitted in the cabinet like two cocks there was something deeper involved from the standpoint of jefferson than the mere questioning of bringing the moneyed class to the side of the government the latter object was sufficiently distasteful to him but the extension of the powers granted by the constitution beyond those which were directly enumerated in the document involved a question of public policy and constitutional law which afforded the basis for the creation of two great national parties the constitution did not anywhere grant in terms to the government the power to establish a national bank even hamilton did not pretend to put his finger on the specific authority for his new project he advanced a doctrine which was eagerly embraced by the particular party which was growing up around him but which was as resolutely opposed by the other party this was the doctrine of the implied powers granted to the new government by the constitution it is doubtful whether the constitution would have been ratified by virginia and other states if this doctrine had been set forth and defended in the state conventions by the friends of the constitution this by no means implies that the policy and doctrine of hamilton were not wise and far-sighted hamilton had definite aims before him and it was his legitimate mission to educate public sentiment up to the point of accepting those aims and of granting him the means for carrying them out the doctrine of the implied powers rested upon the theory that unless they were directly prohibited by the constitution all powers were granted to the government by implication which were found necessary and proper for carrying out the powers specifically granted jefferson came to believe if he did not believe at the outset that the government was one of the delegated powers which were strictly limited to those enumerated in the constitution the doctrine of hamilton from this point of view was revolutionary it meant the conversion of a government holding limited delegations of power from the people and the states into a government having supreme power capable of taking an infinite variety of measures whenever congress in the exercise of its discretion believed that such measures would contribute to the well-being of the union the state governments coming closer to the people than the federal government were most directly threatened by this assumption of power and it was the champions of states rights as well as democratic ideas that jefferson and his friends took their ground as the advocates of the strict construction of the constitution it is not surprising therefore that the proposal to create the bank of the united states called forth in congress prolonged and heated debates but the policy of hamilton had been so far successful in restoring the public credit that he carried the project for the national bank through both houses and it was laid before the president for his approval washington had watched with interest the struggle in the two houses and was somewhat impressed by the weight of the argument against the constitutional power of congress to establish the bank the cabinet was divided jefferson and randolph were against the constitutionality of the bill hamilton knox were in favor of it washington asked each of them to give him in writing the reasons for his opinion 
He weighed them carefully, and then affixed his signature to the bill, February 25th, 1791. The new project realized all the benefits which Hamilton expected. Washington, in his tour of the southern states in the spring of 1791, found the sentiment for union strengthening and the country recovering from the prostration of the era of bad money and political uncertainty which had followed the revolution. He declared in a letter written after his return, quote, Our public credit stands on that ground which three years ago it would have been madness to have foretold. The astonishing rapidity with which the newly instituted bank was filled gives an unexampled proof of the resources of our countrymen and their confidence in public measures. On the first day of opening the subscription, the whole number of shares, 20,000, were taken up in one hour. An application made for upwards of 4,000 shares more than were granted by the institution, besides many others that were coming in from various quarters. End quote. How much was likely to be done by a national bank to bind together the commercial interests of different sections of the country can hardly be appreciated today. At that time there were only four banks in the country. None of these was ten years old, and their combined capital was only one million nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. The Bank of the United States was authorized to establish offices of discount and deposit in all the states and to distribute parts of its capital among eight branches in the chief cities of the country. It was the drafts of these branches upon each other, and their means for reducing to a uniform and reasonable rate the costs of transferring funds, which contributed to knit all parts of the country together in commercial matters, and so strengthened the bond of political union. The bank did not make regular reports to the Treasury Department but its success is indicated by a special report communicated to Congress by Secretary Gallatin, January 24, 1811, which showed resources of $24,183,046. The average annual dividends paid upon the stock up to March 1809 were over 8%. So invaluable were the operations of the Bank of the United States to the public treasury that Jefferson himself, when president, came to its support. His support was perhaps never very hearty, and was due to Albert Gallatin, his secretary of the treasury, whose foresight and ability gave him a rank next to Hamilton among the able men who have presided over the national finances. Gallatin made a strong report in 1809, recommending that the charter of the bank be renewed upon its expiration in 1811, with an increase of capital and wider powers. A new charter was voted in the House, but the bill was not acted on in the Senate, and before the next session the opposition of the state bankers had rallied sufficient strength to defeat the recharter. The second United States Bank was authorized in 1816, under the administration of Madison, and with his approval, but its career was terminated in 1836 as the result of the political hostility of President Jackson. It was not until after the grant of this second charter that the question of the power of Congress to establish a bank came directly before the Supreme Court in 1819. At the head of this court sat John Marshall, who next to Hamilton, perhaps, did more than any other man to strengthen and extend the powers of the general government. The jealousy of the state banks had led the state of Maryland to impose a discriminating tax on the Bank of the United States. If the right to levy such a tax had been admitted, the bank would have been completely at the mercy of the states, and one of the chief purposes of its creation would have been defeated. In order to sustain the right of the bank to exemption from taxation, it was necessary to prove that it was a constitutional instrument of federal power. Hence the question of the power of Congress to create such a corporation came directly before the court. Hamilton found the power to create a bank partly in the preamble to the Constitution, which declares that the people of the United States have adopted it in order to promote the general welfare, but more particularly in that concluding phrase of the clause defining the powers of Congress, which declares that that body shall have authority 
to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested in this constitution in the government of the united states or in any department or officer thereof marshall in the series of great decisions by which he strengthened the power of the union often made use of these provisions to justify his reasoning in one of the most famous of these decisions mcculloch v maryland he sustained the constitutionality of the bank as an instrument of federal power and denied the right of the states to levy upon its property he declared that the power to tax involved the power to destroy and that if the federal government had not the power to withdraw its creations from discriminating legislation by the states the latter might tax the mail or the mints the paper of the customs houses or the forms of judicial process the view of hamilton regarding the power of the federal government to create a bank was thus sustained in emphatic terms by the highest court in the land it was partly his policy in providing for the bank and demonstrating its usefulness with his other measures to develop the powers of the central government which made possible the decisions of marshall if the question of the right to incorporate a bank could have been brought before the court at the beginning before the institution had proved its value, and if men like Jefferson and Madison had been upon the bench, there is at least room for doubt whether a decision would have been rendered in favor of a power which is not granted directly to the government by the Constitution. But by the resolute executive policy of Hamilton and the broad judicial constructions of Marshall, the functions of the new government were extended to all those great objects necessary to create a vigorous and united nation. End of chapter 5, part 1 Chapter 6 of Alexander Hamilton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant Chapter 6 Foreign Affairs and Neutrality, Part 1 The comprehensive measures of Hamilton for strengthening the Union gave a definite character and policy to the Federalist Party. The foundations of this party had been laid by the struggle over the question whether the Constitution should be accepted by the states, but the measures of Hamilton were too strong for some of the friends of the Constitution, and many changes occurred in the temporary groupings of political leaders before a definite dividing line was established between the federalism of Hamilton on the one side and the democracy of Jefferson and Madison on the other. These two eminent democratic leaders had, indeed, been among the most earnest supporters of the Constitution. Madison went farther than Jefferson in the direction of federalism, and encountered the distrust of the state's rights element at home. But Jefferson, as has been already seen, made several reports in the Continental Congress in favor of declaring the United States a nation, and was the cordial promoter of those important steps toward Union, the transfer of the Western Territory to Congress, and the adoption of a common monetary system. The plans of Hamilton in regard to the finances, however, and his resolute policy of neutrality between France and Great Britain, ran counter to the views of Jefferson. It is not surprising, therefore, that the latter found himself pitted against the great Federalist leader upon nearly every question of importance which came before the cabinet. The feeling that he had been duped in regard to the assumption of the state debts found vent in many complaints, which finally bore fruit in open attacks upon Hamilton, at first made indirectly through a clerk in the government service and then directly in a long letter to Washington. Jefferson gave the post of translating clerk in the State Department to a Frenchman, Philippe Freneau, who published a journal known as the National Gazette. In this journal, Freneau began a series of bitter and sometimes well-directed attacks upon the measures of the administration, and particularly those of Hamilton. A friend of Jefferson in Virginia, Colonel Mason, approached Washington in the summer of 1791 and made a long and severe criticism upon the Treasury measures and their effect upon the people. Washington continued to stand above party and sought to mitigate the friction between his cabinet officers. Where the judgments of Hamilton and Jefferson differed on constructive measures, however, Washington in nearly every case became convinced of the wisdom 
of the recommendations of Hamilton. He therefore had the appearance of leaning to his side, although he often mitigated the sharpness of the arguments of his vigorous young minister of finance and endeavored to temper his excess of zeal. After listening to Mason, Washington felt that the time had come to interpose in the growing hostility between his cabinet ministers. He submitted a brief summary to Hamilton of the criticisms which had been made upon his projects and asked him to submit a statement in reply. The charges were directed not only against the substance of the financial measures, but declared that they fostered speculation, corrupted Congress through the ownership of the public debt by members of that body, and that Hamilton was laboring secretly to introduce aristocracy and monarchy. It was not difficult for Hamilton to brush away most of these criticisms. This he did in the cool, logical manner of which he was a master by numbering each objection to his policy and measures and showing that it was not founded upon solid reasoning or fact. Hamilton would have done well to have rested his case upon his letter to Washington, but he was now convinced that Jefferson was behind the attacks upon him, and he determined to strike back. He began a series of anonymous communications through the Federalist organ Fenno's Gazette, which showed all his usual vigor and force of reasoning, but which only intensified the bitterness in the cabinet. President Washington was deeply disturbed by this open outbreak of hostilities and remonstrated by letter with both Hamilton and Jefferson. Hamilton suspended his attacks while Jefferson confined his hostility to less open methods. When Congress met at the close of 1791, Giles of Virginia, a loud-spoken, hot-headed member of the House, called for accounts of the various foreign loans made by the government. An attempt was made to prove corruption in the management of the Treasury. Hamilton could not have found a better opportunity for defending himself if he had sought it. He was no longer shut up to the unsatisfactory methods of unsigned communications through newspapers, but was in a position to speak openly and boldly in exposition and defense of his measures. Report after report was sent to Congress, setting forth the operations of the Treasury with a lucidity and power which silenced the opposition and almost overwhelmed Madison, who had been forced as a party leader to accept the responsibility for the attacks. The reports to anyone who understood the subject were absolutely convincing of the soundness and wisdom of Hamilton's measures. Jefferson, perhaps, had some right to complain of the influence which Hamilton exerted over that department of the government which properly belonged under his exclusive jurisdiction. This was the management of foreign relations. Hamilton had such definite and well-considered views on foreign policy as well as finance that he could not forbear presenting them in the cabinet. His superiority and definiteness of aim and energy no doubt led him to believe that he was fitted for the functions of prime minister and that he was justified in exercising them as far as he could. The course of Washington encouraged him to the extent that the president often gave the preference to his views over those of Jefferson, but it was far from the purpose of the president to make any distinction in rank or in his confidence between his ministers. Hamilton, although an admirer of the British political system, permitted himself few prejudices in his theory of the foreign policy of the United States. Though often charged with British sympathies, he leaned much less towards Great Britain than Jefferson, through his admiration of the spirit of the French Revolution, leaned towards France. The foreign relations of the country began to become acute with the outbreak of war between England and France in 1793. France had already abolished royalty, expelled the nobles, sent Louis XVI to the scaffold, and was on the eve of the terrible massacres which did so much to revolt even her best friends outside the country. The news of war reached the United States early in April 1793. News came also that a minister from the French Republic had landed at Charleston and would soon present his credentials at Philadelphia. Hamilton sent post haste for Washington, who was at Mount Vernon. The outbreak of war meant danger to American commerce on the ocean and the risk of trouble with both powers over the neutrality laws. The serious question confronting the American government was whether they should maintain strict neutrality between the belligerents or should side with France, to whom they were bound by the treaties made with her when she came to the rescue of the colonies. When Washington reached Philadelphia, he found both Jefferson and Hamilton ready with suggestions for meeting the crisis, but these suggestions differed widely. 
Jefferson, although not an advocate of war against England, believed that Congress should be called together in extra session to deal with the emergency. A stronger program was urged upon the president by Hamilton. He regarded the question of neutrality and the reception of the French envoy as one for the executive rather than for Congress. He believed also that these subjects would be safer in the hands of Washington than midst the passions of a legislative body. He drew up a statement embodying a series of questions regarding the policy of the United States, which was laid by Washington before the cabinet. The first question was whether a declaration of neutrality should be issued. This was decided in the affirmative, and the proclamation was soon issued by Washington. It was decided that the French minister, Genet, should be received, but that early occasion should be taken to explain to him that the United States did not consider themselves bound by the treaties to plunge into war in behalf of France. While it was admitted by Hamilton that it would not be the province of the United States under ordinary circumstances to cavil over the character of the government in France, but would be their duty to accept the government which existed, nevertheless, the extraordinary events which had taken place at Paris justified a certain reserve towards the revolutionary powers. End of chapter 6, part 1 Chapter 7 of Alexander Hamilton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant Chapter 7 Hamilton as a Party Leader Part 1 The ratification of the Jay Treaty did much to shake the power of the Federalists, and for a moment seemed to threaten their ruin. It was divisions in their own ranks, however, which contributed as much to this event as any real blunders in public policy. Hamilton was not at his best in conciliating those who differed from him, and he did not encounter a more yielding or tactful associate in John Adams. Hamilton had gone out of his way with little reason at the first presidential election in 1788 to secure votes against Adams. His avowed object was to ensure the election of Washington by preventing a tie vote between Washington and Adams. The original Constitution authorized each elector to vote for two persons for president and vice president without designating the office for which either was voted for. This led to complications which were corrected by an amendment after the election of 1800. In the case of the first election, however, few sane men doubted that Washington would have the majority of the votes, and the only effect of the intrigue of Hamilton was to reduce the vote for Adams to a point which almost caused his defeat. Hamilton supported Adams in the second election in 1792 and the relations between the two men were reasonably cordial. When Washington retired from the presidency in 1797, the commanding men in the Federalist Party were Hamilton, John Jay, Thomas Pinckney, and John Adams. Hamilton was the controlling mind in the consultations of the leaders rather than the sort of man who appealed to the people. He was not seriously thought of by himself or others as a candidate for president. Jay was barred by the odium attaching to the treaty with Great Britain. The choice was therefore reduced to Pinckney and Adams. Most of the leaders were for Adams, who was superior to Pinckney in revolutionary services and ability. It was determined that the Federalist electors should vote for both Adams and Pinckney with the purpose of choosing the former for president and the latter for vice president. Hamilton, on this occasion, urged that all the Federalist electors should vote for both Adams and Pinckney. If each had received an equal number of votes, the choice would have been thrown into the House, and Adams would probably have been elected. Hamilton erred in letting it be known that he was indifferent whether the outcome was favorable to Adams or Pinckney especially when there was a strong suspicion that he was really for Pinckney. Party discipline had not then reached its modern development, and votes were thrown away by Federalist electors. 
in the north to prevent a majority for pinckney over adams and in the south to prevent the same chance in favor of adams the result of these jealousies was that adams barely escaped defeat he was chosen by a plurality of three but pinckney was beaten and jefferson having the next highest vote was elected vice-president adams became firmly convinced that hamilton was his personal enemy and would stop at nothing to injure him that hamilton was recognized by all the party leaders as the mastermind and the guiding spirit of the party made no difference to a man of the hot temper and resolute spirit of john adams tact and conciliation were as far removed from his nature as from that of any american public man the indifference of hamilton whether he was beaten by pinckney in connection with hamilton's intrigue in seventeen eighty eight had convinced adams that hamilton did not feel proper respect for him and that he was seeking to dictate the policy of the administration and to thwart and degrade him adams resented any sort of suggestion or consultation and took delight in disregarding the suggestions of hamilton while the latter struck back through several members of the cabinet who were more in sympathy with him than with the president the country having escaped the danger of immediate war with england by the jay treaty was soon threatened with war with france monroe had been recalled as american minister at paris and charles pinckney who was sent in his place had been refused a reception some of the federalists were so incensed against france that they were eager for war hamilton was opposed to war if it could be avoided but was in favor of a resolute policy adams although as far as possible from sympathy with france believed every reasonable effort should be made to preserve peace it was decided with the approval of both adams and hamilton to send a commission of three to paris to negotiate over the appointment of this new commission new differences broke out between hamilton and the president hamilton favored the appointment of a northern and a southern federalist and of a democrat of the highest standing like madison or even jefferson adams was at first disposed to make these appointments but finally took both the federalists from the south pinckney of south carolina and john marshall of virginia and selected as the third member a democrat of comparatively minor standing gary of massachusetts the commissioners accomplished little good at paris they were insulted and browbeaten and told that only bribery would secure what they desired when their treatment became known in the united states in the spring of seventeen ninety eight there was a popular outburst which restored the federalists to power in congress in the following autumn with a larger majority than ever before since party divisions became fixed enthusiastic addresses poured in upon president adams war vessels were fitted out by private subscription and bills were carried at once for a provisional army for fortifications and for the increase of the navy even under this stress of excitement however hamilton opposed alliance with great britain and persuaded pickering the secretary of state to abandon the advocacy of it it was over the organization of the new army that the hostility of adams to hamilton became open and bitter washington was selected as commander-in-chief but only consented to serve upon the condition that he should have the choice of the officers who were to rank next to him and should not be called upon to take an active part until the army took the field he recommended to the president that rank in the revolutionary army be disregarded and that the three major generals to be appointed should be hamilton charles pinckney and knox this gave the practical command and the work of the organization to hamilton adams sent the names to the senate in the order suggested by washington and they were promptly confirmed when he came to signing the commissions however he took the ground that knox was the senior officer on account of his rank during the revolution hamilton would not consent to this arrangement and all the federalist leaders including members of the cabinet 
remonstrated with the president against it one of the saddest results of the quarrel was the alienation from hamilton of knox who had been a friend of many years and when secretary of war in washington's first cabinet had stood loyally by hamilton against jefferson in the controversy over the financial projects adams at first seemed to grow more stubborn with the protests which were made against his action the leaders finally turned to washington the latter informed the president that if the original agreement as to the rank of the officers was not kept he should resign adams with all his stubbornness and bravery did not dare defy the country by forcing washington from the service he gave way and appointed hamilton to the first place but the good feeling which might have been promoted if he had done so at first was replaced on both sides by bitterness which was never softened hamilton as the practical head of the army showed the same abounding energy and capacity for organization which he had shown at the head of the treasury he drafted a plan for the fortification of new york harbor made an appointment of officers and men among the states and drew up projects for the organization of the new army dealing with the questions of pay uniforms rations promotions police and garrisons and camps and the many other branches of the service all these projects received the cordial approval of washington when congress met hamilton was ready with a bill putting the army upon a basis which would permit its increase or diminution in future without changing the form of the organization in the spring of seventeen ninety nine he was providing for the defense of the frontiers and planning the invasion of louisiana and the floridas end of chapter seven part one Chapter Eight of Alexander Hamilton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Hamilton by Charles A. Conant. Chapter Eight: Hamilton's Death and Character. The death of Hamilton was, in a peculiar sense, a part of his public career he had never hesitated to denounce in strong terms the public career and some of the private acts of aaron burr the latter after losing the presidency sought the governorship of new york and entered into correspondence with the federalist leaders in new england with a view to the formation of a northern confederacy hamilton succeeded in dividing the federalist vote in new york so as to give the election to lewis burr's democratic rival burr then determined to force a personal quarrel upon hamilton in order to obtain revenge upon the man who had so often thwarted him hamilton had no desire to fight but he did not feel able to repudiate the code of the duelist as it was then accepted among gentlemen it was on june seventeenth eighteen o four that colonel burr through his intimate friend judge van ness demanded an apology for a criticism by hamilton which had reached burr's ears several letters were exchanged before it became plain that burr was bound to force a quarrel or to humiliate hamilton to a point which he knew would not be endured when burr's true purpose became plain to hamilton he requested a short time to close up several important cases for his clients which were then pending in the circuit court the circuit having terminated colonel burr was informed friday july sixth eighteen o four that hamilton would be ready to meet him at any time after the following sunday both men realized that the meeting might be fatal and prepared for it in a characteristic way burr who because of his fascinating manners was a great favorite with women destroyed the compromising letters which he had received and devoted his spare hours to pistol practice hamilton had fewer such letters to destroy and was determined not to kill burr if it could be avoided he drew up his will and prepared a statement of his reasons for fighting this statement set forth that he was opposed to the practice of dueling and had done all that was practicable even beyond the demands of punctilious delicacy 
to secure an accommodation. He then said, I have resolved, if our interview is conducted in the usual manner, and it pleases God to give me the opportunity, to reserve and throw away my first fire, and I have thought even of reserving my second, and thus giving a double opportunity to Colonel Burr to pause and repent. The arrangements for the duel were made on Monday, and on the following Wednesday, July 11, the meeting took place at seven o'clock in the morning at Weehawken, three miles above Hoboken, on the west shore of the Hudson. Burr and Hamilton exchanged salutations. The seconds measured the distance, which was ten paces, and the parties took their respective stations. At the first word, Burr fired. Hamilton's weapon was discharged in the air, and he almost instantly fell, mortally wounded. The ball struck the second or third false rib, fractured it about the middle, passed through the liver and diaphragm, and lodged in the first or second lumbar vertebra. Hamilton was at first thought to be dead, but he revived when put on board the boat, which was in waiting, and was able to utter a few words as he was borne towards his home. He died on the day after the meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon. Even in his death he rendered a parting service to his countrymen by the revulsion of feeling which was everywhere aroused against the practice of dueling. The news of his premature taking off caused a wave of grief and indignation to spread over the country, differing from the chastened sorrow felt over the death of Washington because Washington had met his end full of years and honors and in the natural order of nature. The concluding statement made by Hamilton in the paper which he left regarding his meeting with Burr gives some clue to his reasons for fighting. This paragraph ran as follows. To those who, with me, abhorring the practice of dueling, may think that I ought on no account to have added to the number of bad examples, I answer that my relative situation, as well in public as private, enforcing all the considerations which constitute what men of the world denominate honor, imposed on me, as I thought, a peculiar necessity not to decline the call. The ability to be in future useful, whether in resisting mischief or effecting good, in those crises of our public affairs which seem likely to happen, would probably be inseparable from a conformity with public prejudice in this particular. This statement has been construed to mean that Hamilton looked forward to the time when the Constitution would be assailed by extremists, and he would be called by events to put himself at the head of a movement for a stronger government, and perhaps even to lead an army. Several passages in his writings, especially after the downfall of the Federalists, gave color to the view that he feared an outbreak of Jacobin violence in America, and the failure of the Constitution in such an event to resist the strain which would be put upon it. In a letter to Governor Morris, February 27, 1802, he drops into the following gloomy forebodings. Mine is an odd destiny. Perhaps no man in the United States has sacrificed or done more for the present Constitution than myself and, contrary to all my anticipations of its fate, as you know, from the very beginning, I am still laboring to prop the frail and worthless fabric. Yet I have the murmurs of its friends, no less than the curses of its foes, for my reward. What can I do better than withdraw from the scene? Every day proves to me more and more that this American world was not made for me. This mood of despondency was not the usual mood of Hamilton. Much as he abhorred the sympathy with France shown by the Democrats and the tendency towards French ideas, his habitual temper was for combination and action rather than surrender. During the three years which followed the inauguration of Jefferson, he continued, though busy with his law practice, to keep up in private life an active correspondence with Federalist leaders throughout the country and to advise earnest efforts to defeat democratic policies. Only the day before the duel, in a letter to Sedgwick of Massachusetts, he indirectly condemned a project which was on foot 
for a combination of the northern states into a separate confederacy he said that dismemberment of our empire will be a clear sacrifice of great positive advantages without any counterbalancing good administering no relief to our real disease which is democracy hamilton had fears for the future of the union under the constitution which were much exaggerated by his leanings toward a strong self-centered government like that of great britain it is not unreasonable to believe that he felt that he might again be called upon to play a great part in politics as the leader of his party and that under the prejudices then prevailing he would weaken his personal influence if he refused a challenge the public man of that day who could be charged with cowardice or lack of regard for his personal honor would suffer much with the masses if not with the party leaders who understood his character and abilities hamilton hardly needed to prove his personal courage to any reasonable man after his services in the revolution including his reckless charge upon the redoubt at yorktown but political foes might forget these evidences of his character if he should tamely submit to an insult from a political opponent it is doubtful whether his purpose in meeting burr went beyond this submission to the general prejudice in favor of dueling and the belief on his part that his position as a gentleman and a political leader required him to accept the challenge the high abilities and great services of hamilton to the new union have been sufficiently set forth in these pages to make unnecessary any elaborate estimate of his character and attainments his essential merit was that of a constructive and organizing mind which saw the opportunity for action and was equal to the opportunity hamilton was governed to a large extent by his intellect but having reasoned out a proposition to be sound and wise he rode resolutely to its accomplishment taking little account of the obstacles in the way he was not a closet philosopher pursuing abstract propositions to their sources and searching through the discordant threads of human destiny the ultimate principles of all things but his mind was keen and alert in seizing upon reasoning which seemed obviously sound laboring in behalf of his convictions and presenting them with force and simplicity to others he found the career for which he was preeminently fitted in the organization of the financial system and the consolidation of the union under the first administration of washington he was less fitted for the career of a politician in times less strenuous or when tact and finesse were more useful in securing results than clear reasoning and strong argument hamilton was cut off when he had only recently resumed his professional career but was making a distinguished record at the bar always a great lawyer he would soon have accumulated a fortune if he had lived amid the tempting opportunities of today. as it was his legal fees were modest and his sudden death left large debts he bequeathed the request to his sons that they should assume these debts if his estate was insufficient but the gratitude of some of the wealthy federalists relieved them of this filial obligation hamilton had six sons but most of them were already approaching a self-supporting age when he died his oldest son had fallen a victim to the barbarous practice of dueling in a petty quarrel at a theatre three years before his father's death the fourth son mr john c hamilton gave much time to the study of his father's career and prepared the life of hamilton which has been the source of the later work of historians hamilton's widow the daughter of general schuyler survived until eighteen fifty four when she died at the age of ninety-seven years and three months as a man in private life hamilton was loved and respected by those who came closest to him but it was as much by the qualities of his mind as by the special fascinations of his manner he commanded the respect and support of most of the leaders of his party because they were great enough to grasp and appreciate his reasoning but he was never the idol of the people to the same extent as many other leaders he would probably have made a great career in whatever direction he might have turned his high abilities 
but he was fortunate in finding an opportunity for their exercise in a crisis which enabled him to render greater services to the country than have been rendered by almost any man in her history with the exception of washington and lincoln end of chapter eight end of alexander hamilton by charles a conant